Chief of Navies, Head of Coast Guards, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, I will join the previous speaker in thanking um, the RAN for the invitation and of course the Sea Power Centre for facilitating uh, my participation to this meeting. A real honour and a real treat to be here. Looking at the topic that was um, tasked to me, maritime cooperation in the Indian Ocean, and of course the task that Commodore Lockwood has now imposed on, on myself and, and, and Commodore Mead, in, in trying to address the problem, um, for one, I, I remember Captain Justin Jones in our interaction previously has always said that, you know, in looking at a topic like that, I am really preaching to the converted anyway. So in that sense, you know, being in the second day, second last panel, I really think that it's a very easy task for me to simply just reiterate what has already been said, um, leave the difficult task of the functional and, and, and relevant uh, recommendations uh, for my fellow panelists, and uh, to make it less painful for you, I've decided in the last minute to put three slides so that you don't have to look at my face on the very big screen. So I, I've divided my presentation today in, in, in three um, distinctive and simple parts. First of all, I will go through the strategic overview from the Southeast Asian perspective, and you'll hear shortly that it's not that much different from everywhere else. And then, you know, I will very quickly breeze through maritime challenges as, again, you know, it has been addressed um, in, 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 in the previous proceedings. And then to consider prospect for cooperation, and what I like to think about is the need to enhance cooperation, rather. And, and, and in, in my presentation, I hope to, you know, distill three key takeaways um, for myself from, from, from being in this particular forum, and, and I hope it's something that we can, you know, um, consider further. Before I start, I would like to address a question that, you know, Pahashim Jalal uh, asked yesterday in, in what do we mean by the Indo-Pacific, and, and really this is targeted to Pa, um, before you ask me a very difficult question, is that when I refer to the Indo-Pacific, you know, I'm, I'm really just referring to it as a new geographical construct, essentially to refer to the widening of the lens, because as, as Pa, you would probably agree with me that us in Southeast Asia, we have really only been looking at the Asia Pacific and the Indian Ocean has featured very, in, in a very small extent up to recently um, in, in our larger thinking of, of security and, and strategic concern. So really to, to start looking beyond the Asia Pacific to now include the Indian Ocean region. And against the, 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 the backdrop of a make, macro um, region, i.e. the Indo-Pacific, the Indian Ocean in itself is a intensifying, um, is, is a focus of intensifying strategic and political attention and has been described here in Australia uh, by Commodore Sam Bateman and, and Dr. Anthony Bergen in an SP paper that, you know, it is it, and it might be a sea of trouble. And as we heard, extensively yesterday that the economic connectivity across the Indo-Pacific depends largely on maritime links for trade and energy supplies that propel future growth. And much of the world trade in energy originates um, and crosses the Indian Ocean as we heard earlier today as well. And, and with the widespread concern for sea lines of communication across the ocean and energy concern, um, many would argue that these are in fact um, um, issues that has brought about the interest of extra-regional countries in the Indian Ocean region as well. So from, from Southeast Asia, sitting astride, you know, the key slog that, that links the, Indo, uh, the, the Indian Ocean and the Pacific Ocean, economic and strategic connectivity is most tangible in the maritime domain, reflecting also the wider Asia's maritime geography and the sea enduring quality as a maneuver space. Our Dean Ambassador Barry Desker, Dean of the Rajaratnam School in Singapore, often remind us analysts that for all the talk of a flat earth, Asia still owes much of its economic success to shipping networks and the relentless pursuit of greater efficiency and economics of scale. So the potential vulnerability of shipping traversing through the Indian Ocean and onto the wider Indo-Pacific arc is inevitably leading the major maritime state to extend their maritime horizon. And this is done through diplomacy, energy policy, and of course, the development of ocean-going naval capabilities. And, and to take the Gulf of Aden as an example, a large multinational naval force has been employed, undeployed for several years against the persistence threat of piracy from the Horn of Africa. 
And the presence of so many navies from far-flung states is often seen as a clear marker that they see their maritime national interests at stake. And this formation of what used to be taught as an unlikely and very diverse, too diverse coalition does attest to the ability of maritime states to cooperate against common and transnational threats. Moving on to the matter of maritime security threats and challenges. Again, this topic has, has been um, raised and discussed yesterday, so I won't delve into the detail. But simply to, to highlight that, as team speaker yesterday has already highlighted, that threats to maritime security are very evident in the Indian Ocean and the wider Indo-Pacific region for that matter. They include risk of interstate conflict, non-traditional and transboundary security concerns, which we are very familiar with. We are talking about maritime terrorism, piracy, IUU fishing, trafficking and smuggling of, of drugs, arms, people, um, marine natural hazards, and of course, climate change, as we hear earlier today. Energy security and food security, and even the spread of infectious diseases, are all major issues with significant maritime dimensions. On top of that, the Indian Ocean countries are relatively ill-equipped to deal with problems posed by natural hazards and catastrophic risk. Countries in the Indian Ocean are also prone to these um, hazards and, and scientific findings unfortunately suggest that the intensity and frequency of disaster arising um, from these hazards is only going to increase. And of course, as we observed recently, the tragedy, the tragedy involving MH370, that search and rescue and disaster relief are all associated tasks that offer avenues for regional cooperation. So in, in exploring prospect for cooperation and enhanced cooperation in the region, non-traditional security threat in the maritime domain features prominently in issues that are of common concern. But we also all know that you know, no single navy or country can deal with these challenges independently. And this is where I, I concur fully with um, Dr. Gosh, that while we all agree that the value proposition um, on the need to cooperate and collaborate, there is often a lack in a common level of threat perception, and more importantly, a lack of similar priorities that will create the impetus to heighten level of cooperation. So the first point that I would like to put across, and, and it's a key takeaway for myself, is that measures to deal with these threats has to have a twofold objective. First of all, it offers a, a, a very good vehicle for engaging regional partners so that it not only um, deal with mitigating the particular threat, but the, the second fold of the objective has to be one that to see this cooperation to engender better trust and confidence amongst partners. A very good example of, of, of these sorts of initiatives includes arrangement for information sharing, which contributes to maritime security, both to meet current operation needs for, for maritime domain awareness and also as a building block for wider maritime security cooperation. I think the axiom that we all live by is that knowing what is going on at sea is a prerequisite for doing anything constructive about it collectively. Singapore, if I may say so, has taken the lead with maritime information sharing in Southeast Asia and adjacent region by establishing the Information Fusion Center at the Changi Command and Control Center. Being a multinational and multi-agency um, setup, the Information Fusion Center brings together information from diverse sources, and to date we have 64 um, indi indi independent agencies from 32 different countries. The IFC, as we know it, fuses information shared by partner navies and agency and share this across a network of users, heightening the maritime domain awareness of every participant within the network. And this, in turn, allows and helps cue participating countries of any developing situation early and hopefully to be able to respond to such potential threats. Several Indian Ocean region countries, including Australia and India, has posted international liaison officer to the center. And to date, Singapore has hosted 64 international liaison officers from 19 different countries. 
and, and the most recent development, of course, is that the Information Fusion Centre, in collaboration with the Recap Information Sharing Centre and the UK Hydrographic Office, has launched a new maritime security chart in 2013, which mirrors the format adopted by UKMTO in part of the Indian Ocean. It seeks to complement the UKMTO initiative to allow for the seamless transition of the voluntary community reporting to continue from the eastern limit under UKMTO's charge all the way to Hong Kong now. I think one cannot overemphasize that the security of shipping and seaborne trade across the Indian Ocean is a strong common interest for all Indian Ocean countries, as well as extra-regional stakeholders, particularly Japan, China, and the United States. And particular attention is focused on the security and safety of shipping in major choke points in and out of the Indian Ocean. And again, previous speaker has already mentioned the Straits of Hormuz into the Persian Gulf, the Malacca Straits between the Indian and the Pacific Ocean, but I'm wound up into the, the Red Sea just to mention a few. And of course, the detailed measures required in these trades are different. But in broad terms, cooperation between the navies of stakeholder um, nations is required to ensure security of slots in the region. And a point that was highlighted by Professor Lestrange, uh, Lestrange yesterday, um, which I fully agree, is that the Indian Ocean region is much less institutionalized compared with the Asia Pacific. The Indian Ocean Rim Association, uh, IORA, as was mentioned yesterday, and IONS are both concerned with maritime security, but it is really an early days for both to be said to have established itself as a very effective region-wide um, security regime. Having said that, IONS, of course, bringing together navies and a much larger percentage of paramilitary and civil, civilian maritime enforcement agency when compared to other existing regional forum is very much on the right path. It is tailored to the prevailing regional dynamics, seeking to address a broader maritime security dimension. The IORA, on the other hand, comprising of only 20 member states, possess immense uh, potential to facilitate regional cooperation as well. It aspires to become a serious actor in the international system and to spearhead future regional integration as the Indian Ocean grows in its economic importance. Again, I'm, I'm, I'm rehashing a lot of what has already been said, but the, the, the Perth communique, just to refer back to the IORA, um, has said much about the need to look into maritime safety and security issues and, and, and ocean issues for that matter. And it highlighted that the IORA aspiration has to be complementary to IONS as well. And, and there are, of course, you know, um, indications as, as uh, we've seen in a, a very short article by um, Captain Justin Jones and, and Anthony Bergins and uh, the Australian earlier this week, that there are indications for IORA to one thing to develop um, a, a more comprehensive engagement uh, with the academic or track tool um, um, institution as well. And again, you know, this has been addressed yesterday. So moving forward, as we have recognized that many Indian Ocean region has large EEZ but lacks the capacity to effectively manage their offshore areas and exploit their maritime resources, there are these resources tend to be exploited at present largely by distant water fishing nations with low economic returns to the Indian Ocean countries. And many of the Indian Ocean littorals and island countries are unable to afford the cost of maintaining the required maritime forces. So drawing from previous um, presentation and also my own assessment is that a region-wide framework for security management in the Indian Ocean region seems unlikely in the very near future. Major barriers to effective security cooperation includes, and again, these have been mentioned, political sensitivity, both between pairs of regional countries and to the involvement of extra-regional countries, the lack of common interests, the lack of capacity of many regional countries to participate, and of course, the perennial problem of the lack of resources. Commentators have suggested that rather than looking at a Indian Ocean-wide effort, a better and a, a better approach would probably be one that where we consider a, a sub-regional approach. 
And herein lies this, the second takeaway that, that you know, I would like to share with you is that very often when we refer to a sub-regional approach, we have to be quite careful as well because you know, when we refer to the Indian uh, Indo-Pacific per se, it is really a, a supra or a very wide geographical reference which in it have existing recognized region. So it, it may be a bit sensitive to some regional countries to see what is seen to be their regional waters becoming what is referred to a sub-regional um, reference. And in that sense, it will be important for any initiative in the Indo-Pacific, in the Indian Ocean, to consider the aspiration of these growing region and that you know, any of these initiatives should be complementary to the regional or sub-regional aspiration. So I guess the point that I'm trying to make is that while there may be pressing need to develop maritime security cooperation in the Indian Ocean region, basic question remains about the feasibility of doing so and how will and should a regional framework look like. So in this instance, I would like to draw you to the east to share with you a, a case study of, of what is happening in, in our part of the world Really not as a model, but you know, what are some of the lessons that we can learn? Unlike the Indian Ocean region, the East Asia region is replete with institutions addressing regional maritime security concerns, although few, some would argue, have any marked success so far. So is that the model that we want? In the East Asian region, and again, you know, Pak Hashi will attest to it, that the development of an effective regional security architecture has preoccupied not just government, but also academics and other commentators for many years um, before. And most of the current institutions have been established under the ASEAN umbrella, although, again, many has questioned ASEAN's ability to handle serious security concerns. Yet, Intergovernmental security cooperation in East Asia has always been driven by ASEAN and it will remain so. So ASEAN, in turn, has spawned other forums which have some potential to address maritime security concerns. Um, there are now three very prominent forums under the umbrella. Um, of course, the ASEAN Maritime Forum and the expanded ASEAN Maritime Forum, the ARF Intercessional Meeting on Maritime Security, and the Maritime Security Expert Working Group established by the ADMM Plus. And I'll leave it to our esteemed Malaysian colleague, Madam Suraini, to bring you through the details of these initiatives. I guess the reason I mentioned the East Asian model really is to raise the question, as I've raised before, is how regional cooperation should look like. I'm asking a question so I don't have the answer. I spoke about a top-down example where we have a core institution, ASEAN, leading various, often overlapping initiatives. I too have an example of a bottom-up approach, one which we are very familiar with and one that has already been mentioned earlier on, which is the Malacca Straits Patrol. This is where countries with most interest, and in this case, the littoral states, came together to take ownership of the initiative. And I would humbly argue that this bottom-up approach is perhaps what this very wide and diverse um, region need to have interested countries come together, spearheading initiatives that are of greater importance to them and they are most willing to invest in. Hence, the suggestion, as we hear yesterday, of uh, ION's working group is admittedly very worth exploring. The trick here is, of course, the need to be inclusive, yet not to be bogged down by countries which are not quite ready. So if there's a willingness to consider a region minus some approach, one should also consider the region plus some approach where interests of extra-regional countries should also be considered. So I'm going to end my presentation very soon, but really the point is that if we all buy into the idea that regional cooperation is fundamental to the maintenance of good order in the Indian Ocean region, then to achieve this, I think we can all agree that an effective multilateral institution like ions are required through which the requisite cooperation can be considered. Of course, as an academic, I've often been accused of dreaming of the proverbial pie in the sky, so I'll leave it to my fellow panelists to, to bring you through some, some more functional and relevant suggestion. But to end with my final takeaway, and, and this is a key one that I've recognized sitting through the conference proceeding, is that navies 
and all maritime enforcement agencies are facing a new and much more complex set of situation and enormous range of challenges and choices within the Indian Ocean region. How well Navy and maritime defense planner cope with these challenges will determine the stability and security in the region. Thank you very much.